Um, I'm uh, TJ Siles, and uh, so I'm going to be um, his interlocutor today. Uh, I'm going to try to say as little as possible. Um, I was asked to uh, review this um, novel for Alta, and I'm a nonfiction writer, and uh, I, I read a lot of fiction. I've learned a lot from fiction. I urge my uh, fellow biographers, historians, and nonfiction writers to really think about and digest um, the techniques of fiction in their own narratives. Um, but I, this is the first time I've actually been asked to review a novel, and lucky for me, it is absolutely amazing. I mean, I was completely floored. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is, um, we're going to be talking for a while, uh, about um, 40 minutes, and then we're going to throw the floor open to questions. So uh, please be ready with your questions. Um, and uh, with a topic uh, that's so important and about which this novel has so much to say, the temptation is to go straight to the subject. And yet, um, the first and last thing about this book that's important to remember is that it is a work of literature and it is a work of just astonishing literary achievement. And so uh, that's where I, I want to start. Um, uh, maybe. Uh, you could explain, when you had this manuscript, how did you pitch it to your agent? I mean, how did you start off by, there was no one knew who you were, how did you explain this project when you started to talk about it? Um, so I didn't have to, I was very lucky um, in the process of going from manuscript to book. Um, I was a fellow at um, the Writing by Writers conference at Pizza Mollis Bay, so Pam Houston was a teacher at Institute of American Indian Arts, and she was a big supporter of mine. Um, so I was a fellow, and I did a reading, and Claire Bay Watkins, um, she is the wife of Derek Palacio, who was a thesis reader of mine, but she hadn't heard my work, and um, she heard me read um, from, from a manuscript at this Tomorrow's Bay Writing Conference, and uh, she sent it to her agent, sort of like the day after, they both sent it to their agents the day after Trump was elected. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a lucky thing for you, maybe, that Trump was elected. <laughs> <laughs> concentrate on something else. Um, well, you know, it, it's interesting. A lot of uh, fiction MFAs, um, you know, they, their first books are often uh, short stories. And I don't have an MFA, so you can tell me if you think I'm wrong. I'm, I, I tend to think that's often because it's much easier to workshop um, a short story or an essay in nonfiction. And um, so often first books are collections of short stories, sometimes brilliant, um, sometimes that ends up being the best thing people do is their short stories. But, um, but you came out with the first novel. Did you, um, was this something you were working on? Was this your thesis? Or did you do other stuff, come, come to this? I mean, where did this fit into your sort of writing career in this novel? Um, so I wrote half of it before the MFA, and then, well, this is like half of half, because I only, the MFA only requires 120 pages, so um, the second half I wrote mostly um, in a month. My agent had asked me, is the whole thing ready? And I was like, yes. <laughs> I said, just give me a month. And um, I worked really hard for a month and got it to her. Um, in that one. Um, but it was the, the main thing I was working on at the MFA was the novel for sure. I, I did some short stories because like you're saying, like the 15 page sort of, that's how much we can allow per student because there's only so much time to read. And you know with novels it's hard to contextualize a chapter. If you're just going to drop somebody into a chapter, there's so much leaning on that chapter in a novel. It's really hard to get proper feedback. Um, um, I. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be opening it up a little bit more, uh, and you can take it at any time to talk about um, uh, many of the dimensions of the novel, but just to stick to kind of the writing craft of it uh, for a moment. Um, I was trying to coax you to describe the novel <laughs> for everybody, but it's a, um, it is a uh, incredibly intricately written um, book that, um, pardon me, I don't think I've turned off my own phone yet. Um, incredibly intricately written plot that involves numerous characters. 
And it's not just that they're different characters, but it's written in different voices. And, um, you know, it switches sometimes from third person to first person to second person. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. And uh, also the, the way in which the plot drives forward, I mean, that could easily have just been a set of character studies, which is something I say in, in my review that, you know, it, it would have been a very interesting and, and perhaps still in, just as important um, as a set of character studies. But the, the elements in each chapter weave into the others, and it, be, and it ends the first chapter with a, a propulsive set of expectations that carry the reader forward. And then there are also moments of realization and, and revelations that sometimes from the very beginning of the book bear fruit on the very last page. And so um, uh, it, it, it makes me think about a conversation I had once with Adam Johnson with his very interestingly and, and tightly plotted um, Orphan Master's Son. Um, and he said that he actually didn't plan it from the beginning, that, um, that it just kind of evolved as he wrote it, which is astonishing because it seemed like it was so well thought out. How, since you wrote it in two ch sections, but you always envisioned it as a novel, um, what was that process like? Can you just talk about writing the different voices and also you know, keeping it as one intricate piece of um, fabric? Yeah, so um, the idea for the whole thing, um, I guess you could say it was ambitious, but I, you know, I didn't think of it that way. I thought of it, um, like maybe two weeks after I found out I was going to have a son. Um, Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so the novel and him are, are um, pretty much the same age. Uh, but I thought of the whole idea of, uh, I, I, I'd known just on a craft level that I wanted to write a multi-voiced um, novel and have all of their voices, you know, interweave and for it to really earn its name as a novel and not have it be interlinked stories, which there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, like, um, we were just talking about Colin McCann and what Luke Perry wants to and what he does in there. Um, I was really fascinated with the idea of, of being able to read multiple stories together and have it really feel cohesive. You know, they have they have to be this has to be an all these all these characters that you're hearing from are essential to what's happening as a whole. Um, so I knew that right away. The, the idea just dropped into my head that I was gonna write this multi voiced um, or polyphonic novel and all of their lives would converge at a power of the Coliseum. Coliseum. So I didn't start writing into that, you know, I I had a son and that took over my life for about a year. <laughs> and then I started writing into it um, a year after that. Just started waking up like a time in the morning. Did you find yourself going back and then kind of reworking chapters that you could have the threads kind of, I mean, you know, was that a lot of back and forth process or did it kind of emerge pretty naturally since it was such a long running idea in your head? In the middle of it, um, I felt full of despair. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how to get out or how to like make all the threads connect and there's like a, you know, there's a hump you have to get over um, because once you have enough momentum and you understand, I, I always had the light at the end of the tunnel that was what would happen at the end. Uh, but there was a moment where I didn't quite know how to do work in the middle. Um, and actually it was running that helped me, going on long runs um, and forgetting that I was thinking about it, which I always was, because I was like pushing myself. I know, I live uh, like in the foothills of the Sierras and it gets up to like 100 degrees so you can't really think too much. You know, I get really dumb in the heat like when it's too hot I'm just like, like I'm a zombie. But I was running like for you know between like two and five miles and these ideas from out of the ether were just the solutions to the, my deepest problems of how to connect all of, all of these narratives. Um, they would just come to me and I would write them down on my phone while I was, you know, I would slow to a job and like, Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the first time I've heard that method. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, maybe you know, we'll have a novel from Donald Trump at some point, except he doesn't jog. Um, uh, between Big Macs, I guess. But anyway, uh, I, I shouldn't assume that everybody in, in Marin is uh, anti-Trump. I apologize. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the most important things about this book is that it's, a, it's written by Native people who live in Oakland, California, and yet it, it does, it, it, it struck me as this kind of amazing um, way in which this literary 
um, approach that we were talking about, having different voices, not only different characters, different voices, and, and kind of taking you deep into these characters, they're so rich and real. And yet that reflects, it, it seems at least, I, um, I don't want to um, speak for you, it, that seems so reflect um, Native America today and Native history. Um, where there are, there are so many different ways to be anything in America, and certainly it has always been true with um, the indigenous in the United States. Is is that um, is that something that you were thinking about? That, that this this multifaceted experience, this kind of multi-layered identity, is something that would all that would work together with the way you want to write. I mean, you talk about it. I think uh, I've found that that in retrospect. Um, it's tempting to sound like I was like consciously masterminding this thing and like thinking of all these layers, um, but honestly, it was it was a pretty instinctual process, pretty unconscious. A lot of the stuff that went into it. In retrospect, I'm like, yes, that totally seems right. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't go into it like with a, a lot of heady um, ideas. I I went in I. You know, I put my head down and I worked really hard and I wrote a lot and I revised a lot. You know, and I tried to make the stories feel true to my experience. Um, and a lot of these things that have emerged from the complexity of the design have been, I, I don't want to say accidental, because I, you know, I do think about these things. But uh, the creative process is mysterious and, and sometimes you get things that you don't know that you meant. Um, so, so to some extent, I did design it, and to other, so there's emerging qualities that have come from it, um, like this this idea that you know we're sort of crushed by a monolithic idea of the native person, and that's like a headdress image and a forlorn, a sad horse looking usually a horse's head kind of guy, and then that's the end. It's like this romanticized end of the natives, and uh, and it's you know. I don't think it's an accident that that if you don't let look like this particular native that we all sort of have to compare ourselves to, then you're not native, and you know, constantly struggling against this idea of what it means to be. We we look like a range of things. Um, you know, this is, there's this in in black communities and Asian communities, people face this like you think we all look the same. For us. If you don't think we look the same, you think there's only one way to look native because you don't know enough native people. There's a big spectrum of what we look like. Um, so it's you know it's it's an insidious thing. Yeah, I think I, I was listening to an interview that you were doing where you talked about um, at Minless I'm mistaken, um, about how there was deliberate attempt to kind of almost breed out natives out of existence. And then there comes along um, you know, people who demand that you justify yourselves to the kind of white majority that, well, you don't look like what I expect you to look. So somehow your identity, I get to make statements and assumptions about your identity. Well, I was just in New York um, at a book expo thing, and um, two different times in two different contexts, um, non native people came up to me for me to sign their books, and they said, um, What are you native? <laughs> and then they go, and this is this is an important uh, this is an important word and a comma. Well, uh, how much? <laughs> People feel like they have the right to ask. You know, yeah, it's a very invasive question. That, that it's incredibly invasive, and it's this. Uh, it, it's it's really. Um, uh, it, it, it's there's a, a part of the book that just so speaks to that, that, and it's something that again from my review for Alta that I, I quoted, where you talk about the range of, of what it means to be um, uh, an American Indian, and and you say at the end of what was it the the undoable math insignificant um, was it insignificant remainders. remainders yeah, and that's so interesting because. Insignificant remainder, you've been talking about the idea of blood and ancestry and how that's been imposed on, on native people to define them, that, that other people get to define them. And then insignificant remainders is a historical illusion. This idea that native people that, we, that, that the United States had 
are going to just die out. I mean, this is something I wrote about with, with Custer, where he, he'd been, you know, hoodwinked as well as outfought and outmarched in the field. He was writing his memoirs, and he had to try to explain it. How is it that these people are very much, you know, my equal, and yet, you know, I feel racially superior to them? And so, you know, he brought in the whole idea of the disappearing Indian. That, well, they're, they're savages, and so they're going to disappear when civilization comes up. And this still persists to this day. I mean, um, you know, has, has um, you know, you, you uh, studied at, um, you know, a, a program specifically for Native people. Um, what was that? I mean, I assume that was a great experience. It produced a terrific novel. Um, can you just talk about that a little bit and what it's like with other Native writers in the community today? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one of the, uh, despite having, not despite, uh, in addition to having um, an excellent faculty, um, the idea of coming into a workshop with your work and not having to explain yourself and you know, not ha having to contextualize or, or, ha or having to explain before you can even get to the work it take, can take up, you know, there's limited workshop time. Um, I think our program for Native writers and for, for people of color in general um, provides this space where we really focus on craft and um, and there's, you know, the institution of writing has been dominated by whiteness mm -hmm. and whiteness as superior for so long. Um, so it, it was just a great communal space. Um, and to not ask people to have to explain themselves or, or um, to think about a reader who doesn't have context and have to like, on a craft level, cleverly work in a sort of, um, some way to contextualize for, you know, for the main white reader. Um, yeah, Basil Exposi Exposition character. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that was, I mean, it was great to, it's lonely being a writer, it's lonely being a Native person. Um, and to be both, uh, you can imagine. So to be in a Native writing community, it was, it was a revelation for me. Well, there's, it, what's interesting is that, um, uh, again, someone that we were just talking about before, um, and whose, whose work I admire immensely, and I referenced in my review, Viet Nguyen, who is a, a great fiction writer, period. And then also he writes about what it means to be a refugee and also what it means to be um, Vietnamese in America. And he, he said something really interesting. I think it was an essay or an op-ed he wrote where he talks about, you know, there is this um, coming out of, you know, championed by the Iowa Writers Workshop, this idea of show, don't tell. And there's, there's a whole <coughs> a aesthetic of writing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of privileged that this is the way you do it. And he said sometimes, in fiction, it's, it's a great thing to just tell. And you start off and you have in, in this novel, um, which shows so well, you just sometimes just tell, you just like, you start off with um, this reflection on the Indian head in American culture. I mean, I, you know, take it from there, what you would say about either that specifically or about telling. Well, first, just uh, to speak on, like, what else this program has been um, in regards to form itself. Um, you know, if your curriculum and the institution that's teaching it thinks all of the best writing that's ever existed is 99% white men, um, you have a, a problem of form that you need to consider, like how form arises from experience and how you know, diverse voices and diverse experience brings about different forms, and I think the novel is a great place to experiment and form. It's called the novel for a reason. You do, you, you do new things, you create different ways of building worlds. Um, so I think the program is great for being very open to, you know, not teaching Hemingway and Carver as gospel, um, and not teaching a lot of these institutional, this is the way to write. Um, uh, it allows for experimentation, and if you look at Therese Mayotte's book, Heartberries, which is amazing, she's doing formally experimental stuff with, with the memoir, and I'm doing formal experimental stuff with the novel, and it was supported um, in the program, and I, and I think that's a really cool aspect to, um, as far as like, you know, the way a, a program in an institution can influence um, just on a formal level. Um, 
based on experience. It just made me think of, um, you know, George Orwell in his great essay on writing um, uh, politics in the English language has this list of rules, and he has at the end, um, break any of these rules rather than write anything that's outright barbarous. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just, it's interesting that some of the people who are breaking all the rules and yet writing some of the most magnificently civilized stuff are people who in that community was considered barbarians, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, which is, and I think it, there's a relationship there. Um, no, I was just saying, I was saying about, you know, telling and, and showing. And I, I think you also mentioned that, you know, you wrote this, um, this novel for Native readers. And yet there's also these moments when, well, and I shouldn't say also, I mean, because there's, there's a lot of, you know, cry from the heart. Um, where you're kind of speaking directly to the reader and, and leaving, departing the narrative to just speak you know, directly to the reader. Um, was that something that was just organically came in? Is that something where you, again, when you were doing this, you were thinking about um, native readers, you were thinking about everyone else who might read it? I mean, what was your, how did that process work? Of, like I said, we talked about it. sometimes it's good to just tell, to break that rule. Yeah, and you brought up the Indian head. That was the thing yeah, that yeah, I lost. Very good. Yeah. Um, so I knew that I wanted to write a prologue um, going into it. People have been calling it nonfiction and essay, which um, is the tone. But you know, it's written in the we, and uh, I very much just meant it to be part of the novel. Um, I don't have anything wrong with the nonfiction or essay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't really like, you know, I don't think any of the genres should be given any sort of, you know, better than, you know, only well, yeah, or, or that there has to be this, this firm boundary, you know, where turning and speaking to the reader is something you do and it feels organic to what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was working on this thing the whole time alongside all um, right, the novel it's a little more like scene and story and a little more like showing rather than telling and this is like straight up telling pretty much there's like no scenes except within the telling um, and the Indian head just struck me um, in doing research um, interestingly enough like like some of my characters doing um, internet research on their background I came across so my dad's dad didn't accept him as a son and this is a, um, this is related to um, how on my certificate de degree of Indian blood, if you didn't know, um, Native people have a certificate degree of Indian blood. Officially says how much blood you have mm -hmm. in your body. Um, <laughs> this is for who? <laughs> who? Who is this? This is like the official government or tribal um, document that, you know, if you want to get enrolled in your tribe, you have, they, they know exactly the percentage. And so my dad's dad didn't accept him as a son. So on his birth certificate, he doesn't have a father. And so he's, even though everyone knew who he was, it's a small town that he grew up in, he's a Cheyenne man. Uh, my dad's full blood. But, um, uh, you know, technically he's half Cheyenne and half nothing. It makes me a quarter Cheyenne and a quarter nothing. And makes my son not able to enroll in our tribe, which ultimately erases the line within my generation. Um, so, anyway, I, I was researching online and I found this um, old Cheyenne story that was told by um, my grandpa. Um, no, my, sorry, my dad's dad's dad, um, my great-grandpa. Um, and it's a story about a rolling head. And it's this, you know, it, it, I tell it a little story. Up. Yeah, that's, right. a, that's an old Cheyenne story that I found online, like through the Cheyenne and Arapaho website, which just had like a weird little archive of stories. And so uh, I'd already been meditating on the head and now um, out at Plymouth they put an Indian head at the front for 25 years for people to see it um, as sort of a conqueror's like, don't mess with us, so it's um, And then, you know, on jerseys that were unwilling to end on, you know, all these different Indian mascots, it's the Indian head. And then the Indian head test pattern is how the novel starts. And it's sort of this like pride in you know killing us and erasing us and unwilling to let go of the fact. Um, so the writing this sort of essay um, historical account had to do with 
just wanting to everyone to get on the same page before we even start talking about the story, because so many people have heard it wrong for so long, and you could f you could look up this stuff on the internet, like I did, um, but facts are not compelling anymore, especially in, in the era of fake news. So I, I wanted to find out what way to write it in a way that was interesting to read for Native people, even if you knew to some extent how messed up history is, um, to write about it in a, in a compelling way with layers. Um, it, that's what I wanted to do, to make history, you know, readable, and not like, you know, it's, it's so often it's not readable, or it's yeah. false. Yeah, well, thank you. I write history thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I know what to say now. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 absolutely true, and and so often um, uh, there. What's interesting is that in terms of being willing to take um, other perspectives and groups that have been, um, you know, victimized and marginalized, the, the academic discipline of history, that I'm not an academic, um, has gotten much better. And yet, in terms of writing, it's very rigid, you know, it's a professional discipline that's very rigid forms. It's very interesting how um, that, that, you know, question of rigidity and expectations. Um, you know, this, it's a no this is a novel um, which is, so much of what, what drives it forward is, is, is both self-discovery and self-realization and a discovery of connections between people. So, you know, you were just describing, you know, this, this relationship between you and your father, your father and his father, and, and you know, this is such, and, and you've spoken about um, what it's like to be Native in, in, in an urban setting, in, in Oakland specifically, which is very much the concrete, very real setting of this book. Um, and so, you know, maybe you could um, just talk for a couple of minutes about, you know, your own, your own path toward writing and your own experience, however you want to talk about it, your, your biography a little bit. I mean, you know, you didn't start off, you know, saying, I'm going to be a novelist someday, and then, you know, finally you achieved your goal. I mean, why don't you describe your kind of path toward this and your own background? So, um, yeah, we had a lot going on with my family, um, and we weren't particularly encouraged in school. My sisters were pretty crazy, like drugs and gangs, and um, I just had to not do that to succeed, to, <laughs> to be seen as succeeding. Um, Did so, you all have the same two parents? Yeah, up until 13 and this point. Um, but, uh, so I, I, did, I had no, no one told me that I was creative or smart or that I should do anything related to academics or books or, um, and I was good at roller hockey, I found. Um, so we played, you know, we played on the streets of Oakland first and then roller hockey in the 90s was like really big in the Bay Area. There was a professional team that played at the Coliseum called the Oakland Skates. And it seemed like a possibly doable path. Um, so I was way into doing that. Um, and I got, you know, I got a lot of good support Early on, it was like sponsored by a company, and was going nationally to for, for national tournaments. And um, I wasn't a reader or uh, a writer at all, and I basically like almost dropped out of school and just barely made it through. Um, and then I became a musician. Um, my mom and sister just ran and got me a guitar for my 18th birthday, based on thinking that I maybe um, had some kind of inclination. And I totally fell in love with music and um, became a musician and fell in love with piano and then uh, got a degree in sound engineering and it wasn't until I graduated from, from college that I found reading. It was, I came really late to it and because of that I became super obsessed with, um, with reading and then eventually with writing and feeling like I needed to play catch up. Um, so I spent the next, you know, 13 years from then until now just really going at it as hard as I could. Um, that's really good about that. But I didn't have dreams even once I became a writer of like, maybe one day I'll get into New Yorker or will become a New York Times bestseller. Like my 
my dreams are super reasonable. I was like, <laughs> small university press, teaching job, stability. <laughs> for for Ryder, that's actually a pretty, pretty outrageously aggressive dream. <laughs> By the way, I, I can use a job. I, uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, it's, I'm not going to ask, though you certainly can, um, you know, how much is autobiographical, that's such a common question. Um, I mean, like I said, you know, there's, there's, I, well, one of the things, by the way, I have to say that I really loved is that, um, you know, the, the, the tone in the novel, you know, changes, um, you know, there's, there's dread, there's conflict between um, people who have histories together, uh, there is a sense of, of being kind of at sea, and then there's moments of incredible humor, and it's it's really really funny. Um, I mean, you know, is that did you just set out? Did that just come naturally, or did you set out and say, you know, this, you know, this has got to be, like, it's, I've got to lighten up. I mean, you know, like how did you manage those those changes? I, I have a hard time writing funny. So. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't think I was doing it. I, I wrote it, and then like one of the first times I read in front of people, I was like, "What are you guys doing?" <laughs> uh, so I was like, honestly, like very surprised that there was humor throughout. Well, I think it's great too because again, you know, there is this kind of um, you know white majority culture um, uh, that kind of imposes a um, a view of what a native should be, and you know, like solemn. You know, the, the image of the guy who actually was, what, he was Italian, Cody Selby, you know, the, the Iron famous... Ice Cody. Oh, Iron Eyes Cody. Cody, yeah. The the guy who d did the anti-litter commercial turns and cries, you know. With, I mean, that, that, you know, that stereotyped image is, of course, human beings are, they're funny and they squabble and they have, as well as being noble and having big dreams and they mess up and... And, um, you know, again, when, with your interview, uh, or your conversation, actually, it was in time, I think, you talked about the fact that you just, you, you try to write this reality and not, you know, either respond to the expectations of the, um, the kind of imperial culture, or to try to feel like you've got to put the best foot forward and represent for the community. You, you represent it in the best way, it seems to me, but, you know, it's an outsider. I mean, um, is that what you were thinking when you were just trying to be as real as possible? Yeah, I mean, wanting to be true. Gertrude Stein, funny enough, said, somebody asked her, what's your secret? And I'm not some huge Gertrude Stein fan. I just I came across this quote, and it fit, it fit like sort of the native, it was a parallel. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have anything against her. Her sentences are just busy, and I can't get through like more than two or three. <laughs> um, she said, somebody asked her what's her secret, and she said small audiences. And, you know, I was writing for the urban Indian community in Oakland. Um, I was wanting to get it right for that community that I came from. Um, so the fact that there's been universal appeal and, you know, that the that readers are just loving it, um, or at least buying it, um, has been really meaningful, and I don't really know why. But. Well, I mean, literature is the art of, of speaking to what it means to be human, and the universal is in the, the particular, and this is very particular and true. Yes. Explain the title, please. So, um, There There is, is from Everybody's Autobiography by Gertrude Stein, and in it, somebody's asking her what it's like to be back in Oakland after, um, after being gone. She, you know, she spent her childhood there, and then she was gone, and she came back. And she said there's no there there, but she was she was referencing that it was developed over and unrecognizable. And so for native people obviously, um, the idea of land and how we've been removed and things have been developed over and um, to to still find and seek belonging and home and environment within whatever wherever you're from, in this case, um, you know, Oakland in the city. Uh, I just thought it fit really well and the Radiohead song just happened to have like amazing lyrics to fit some of the themes of the book, but that was a coincidence. Um, so let's uh, take some questions from the floor. Uh, we don't have a mic for you, so I will repeat uh, your question. And if you if you don't, I've got some lame questions I, I set aside. So. Um, yes, ma'am, in the back, please. Uh, 
Was it right? You're, you're looking around. Yes. See. Okay. Um, thank you so much for writing this book. Um, I was part of a team at the Native American Health Center in Oakland in 1986 that did surveys um, <clears throat> with all the uh, 500 Indian people uh, completed this survey about what the needs were. And there were 94 different tribes that were represented in that survey. Does your sense of that, I mean, you're younger than uh, I am, but I mean, <laughs> is your sense that that diversity has kind of remained in Oakland and, you know, solidified or fractured given all the this stuff that happens in Oakland? Again, this is a question about the diversity of um, the Native community. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, my first job at the Native American Health Center was a data entry point, um, and I did that for a while. Um, so I was able to actually see a lot of the numbers, and, and then just from experience and being in the community, um, it's very intertribal, um, because relocation is something that the U.S. government pushed um, that, that was related to the termination policy. It had to do with, um, it was related to the kill the Indian, save the man sort of campaign of like push them into the city away from their communities and their culture and eventually they'll assimilate to the point of disappearance. Um, and that didn't happen. Indian centers starting it, started up and, and families found each other and uh, people came from different tribes. People came to the major cities like Oakland and LA and New York and Minneapolis and um, Phoenix and all these major cities have Indian centers and we have community events and um, we have um, American Indian Child Resource Centers in, in these cities and um, this creates like you know generations of Indian families that, that end up uh, intermarrying with different tribes so you have it's a very diverse uh, community. Oh, by the way we, we are going to have him read um, but let's uh, take a few questions. I think that'd be a nice way to go out. So, uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. You referred to a song, and the song went up long before the there. What did you refer to? about the Radiohead song that went with there, there. It's just a Radiohead song called There, There. <laughs> Where I can find it on the radio, on the internet, looking for music. If you, there, there. in YouTube, search okay. uh, Radiohead. Space there, there, you'll find it for sure. And, and you alluded to this um, hybrid, I started to talk. You alluded, and today, when you talk to this Indian head on the television, maybe there's people that haven't read the first book that you talked about. I found it. I just was drawn in right away, knowing about that, and how much I had seen that, and didn't even register in my head. Explain what that Indian head on the she just has to explain the, the Indian head on the, the television screen. So yeah, I, I didn't grow up seeing it. Um, it. It was a research thing. And when I found out that that was a thing, and the fact that nobody knew why it was there or who had drawn it, there's just a, uh, the original artwork on the back just says Brooks. <laughs> nobody knows. Um, so it felt like a really like subconscious or unconscious, like um, insidious message to the same one that comes on jerseys of like, yeah. we won, get over it. And you'll hear that in comment threads. I wrote a, a piece against Thanksgiving in the LA Times. And go to it. If you want to know what the ugly underbelly of American consciousness is toward Native people, there's about 200 comments. And there's some of the most horrific, hateful uh, speech there about Native people. Like, it, it was, I, I probably won't go to another comment thread after I write something, but um, it's worth seeing. It, you know, you should keep your eyes open to things like this and not look away. Yeah, I, I um, went to, I grew up in Minnesota, went to college there, and lived in Minneapolis for a while. It has a reputation for being a very liberal city. There's a large Native um, community there, and I've heard some blatantly, just unapologetically racist stuff from, from Minnesotans. Yes, ma'am, uh, you had a question, I believe? Yeah. Um, we have Lakota Harden in the back, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> local celebrity. <laughs> you know, I have to be honest, I haven't read it. Like, I left the Bay and went to Alaska, and I recommend it to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's been amazing, but I also kind of lost 
And thank you so much. I didn't realize you knew who I was. We met on Alcatraz briefly. It was actually on the ferry over. Okay. I feel so, you just lifted my spirit. I'm 51 and I feel obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> my son bought me your book and I, I haven't read it. I can't wait to. I'm so excited. I saw it, you know, Morningstar and Mary and everybody's, you know, it's all over my newsfeed and I'm so glad that we had a chance to run away to a slip. And I said, she said, we can do this. We can stop in. And um, what I wanted to say to you is, first of all, I'm going to pray for your protection. Because mm -hmm. when you're a spokesperson for us, mm -hmm. you are fighting centuries of guilt that people don't want to admit. Because if they admit it, then they have to stop doing it to mm -hmm. indigenous people around the world. Yeah. And it's probably not going to stop. And so you become a target. So I'm going to pray for your protection always, because just listening to you and seeing and YouTubing you and you know looking at the videos, you are so brilliant, and you are following the of what what we have been taught, and that's not we don't follow the gold glittery stuff. We stay, we keep our feet in the water, we keep our bare feet on the land. You know, we say thank you every time we. We see that water. We say thank you for having drink that water. That path that has stayed alive, that has kept us going, making relatives wherever you go, that's that, that's what matters the most. And that's what you've done. And when I was a young girl, a young activist before face, you know, Facebook, <laughs> but when I was young and would pray in our ceremonies, you know, we all go back to our ceremonies one way or another. In fact, I'm leaving a couple of days for to do that. To never leave that to me. That's important to me for my existence. I asked them at the time, I said, what's happening? We can see what's coming. We can see this purification is what they called it and translated into English, coming. And it's going to affect everyone and we're seeing it now. Right? But they said, don't worry. These are the ancestors. We're coming back and we're going to help you. And we're going to help speak your truth. That's you. And I'm really grateful that you came back and help us. Because we really need it, and a lot of us have been doing this our lives. It's not a choice to be an activist or a spokesperson. It's our path. It's who we are as Native people, indigenous and caretakers. That's the original definition. It's caretakers of this land, and that's who you become by using this medicine that you've given us. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. I think it, it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, when non-native, uh, you know, people approach uh, um, uh, uh, Tommy and his book, like, we can't ask you to speak for other people. You you speak for yourself and as much for, you know, anyone else as you choose. But, you know, you, you, you can't impose upon, which happens so often. Where it's, it's, you know, people who are not white are demanded to be the ambassador and the spokesperson for everybody else in the world. And uh, um, and so, you know, that kind of, you know, speaking for, for things beyond yourself. But if you choose, that's great. But we have no right to demand um, that anyone play the role of ambassador. Um, go ahead. Who, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah. Um, I've been uh, blessed to be around the Indian community for a long time. Uh, as a non-Indian, but I wonder, I haven't read your book yet, and I'm wondering about whether you talk about the, the flip side of denigration, which would be the, the white people that kind of worship Indianness and the wannabes. Do you talk about wannabes in Oakland? Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> 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 no. Tell the <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm referencing some of that in the book. Uh, I had parts that were taken out. That um, There was just a whole chapter that, that went into that a little bit that was taken out. Um, it's something that it's at the heart of you know the Native conversation about what it means to be Native. And especially for Native authors. We have authors who have like, you know, claimed heritage when they don't have it. And when they've been questioned, so Joseph Boyden, the First Nations, uh, now I can no longer say that in front of him. Um, he's an author that was well respected and well read and awarded. Um, there was a long 
um, journalistic piece done on his heritage and it's like switched which tribe and how much over the years and ultimately came out with his sort of statement trying to reclaim it as like, oh, the guy doesn't really have claim to identity. And like, it's really dicey when you start talking about blood and um, who gets to say they are and aren't. Um, but it's a conversation that we have to have. And uh, the Indian worshiping um, or the romanticizing um, white people of the world, I didn't give too much real estate in the book. But, you know, it's a thing and it's, um, I don't know, my mom might have it to some extent. But, you know, it's a, it's a problematic thing. Um, just as much as, as saying, like, we're not here or we get checks every month, um, saying that we're, like, you know, we're, if we're romanticized, it's two sides of the same point, and we, what we need is complexity, because we've been turned into one thing, yeah. and we're human, and that de dehumanizes it. If you, if you just think we're one thing, mm -hmm. there's no way to be human if you're one thing and one thing. Yeah, and that's, I, again, I, I think that um, the complexity of the human experience of what it's like to be Native in, in America, I mean, you know, the, um, so much of the kind of, there's this template for the minority experience that comes from the African Americans, who have their their own very important and central to American history and role, and yet that process that created African Americans was the theft of human beings from multiple cultures and languages, all being thrown together, where they had to create a new people. Whereas Native people existed in an astonishing array of cultures, and and that that diversity that that both that that sense of community and, and shared identity and yet also specific identity is something that I was that I was saying is reflected in the way the book is written. It's about all these different people, each of whom is so complicated and real. And it's that's why it's great writing. Um, let's take one more question and then let's uh, let him read for a little bit. Uh, Tom Barbash in back. Hey. Um, so I was gonna sort of conversation was just ask a anomalous question, which is when you talk about that period of despair, you know, that you get through where, where like I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to finish it. So which almost everybody I writer I've talked to have finished books that they're happy with mention that period. So how did you get out of it? Like and, and was it sort of you had this huge ambition all of a sudden you had to strip away parts of it or you know, like did it, did it morph in some way? How? What? What brought you out of that place where you thought, I, I can't see the end? How did you get out of despair? Is the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, in some ways, I it's a mystery, and I know that when I for a next book, I'm going to end up there again. So if there was some like bottled formula I could sell to fellow novelists, you know, I would do it. But um, in some way, it remains a mystery because the whole thing is elusive, how do you even do the whole thing? I know that if you keep showing up to the page, uh, read out loud. I have um, Robot Voices reading the book. It's an app called Voice Dream. There's another one called Natural Reader. Um, my guy is named Micah, and he has a southern drawl. Because <laughs> it makes him sound a little more human. And uh, I, I, I pick up a lot of insights. Um, so continual revision, I happen to like being involved in a novel, even though I'm describing it as despair. Once I like, turned in the whole thing and didn't have anything to chew on, my, like my restless mind to chew on anymore, um, that was worse despair than being <laughs> caught in the middle because I had nothing like it. Um, just continually going back uh, and believing there's an element of faith that if you keep going back to it, something will happen, something will change. So it's elusive as to what that answer is. Like I said before, I, I ran a lot, and sometimes answers would come, robot voices, uh, and continually returning to the page. No, I, I just went through it. So it's a, I need that idea of running, you know, and having it, and being it. You know, and there, I didn't know about the robot voices, but I wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, so should we have a read a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So I'm going to read um, just. I have a prologue and also an interlude, which is similar in tone to the prologue. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit from that. Do you want to stand? That's what you need to Mike, stand? Oh, sure. 
Did you wander around? <laughs> 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 I always, whenever I do an event, I always try to do a sock puppet section. So. <laughs> okay, so like I said, this is um, from the answer with, and there are um, subtitles within it. So, blood. Blood is messy when it comes out. Inside it runs clean and looks blue in tubes that line our bodies, that split and branch like Earth's river systems. Blood is 90% water, and like water it must move. Blood must flow, never stray or split or clot or divide, lose any essential amount of itself while it distributes evenly through our bodies. But blood is messy when it comes out. It dries, divides, and cracks in the air. Native blood quantum was introduced in 1705 at the Virginia colony. If you were at least half native, you didn't have the same rights as white people. Blood quantum and tribal membership qualifications have since been turned over to individual tribes to decide. In the late 1990s, Saddam Hussein commissioned the Quran to be written in his own blood. Now Muslim leaders aren't sure what to do with it. To have written the Quran in blood was a sin but to destroy it would also be a sin. The wound that was made when white people came and took all that they took is never healed. An unattended wound gets infected, becomes a new kind of wound like the history of what actually happened, became a new kind of history. All these stories that we haven't been telling all this time, that we haven't been listening to, are just part of what we need to heal, not that we're broken. And don't make the mistake of calling us resilient. To not have been destroyed, to not have given up, to have survived is no badge of honor. Or would you call an attempted murder victim resilient? When we go to tell our stories, people think we want it to have gone different. People want to say things like sore losers and move on already. Quit playing the blame game. But is it a game? Only those who have lost as much as we have see the particularly nasty slice of smile and someone who thinks they're winning when they say get over it. This is the thing. If you have the option to not think about or even consider history, whether you learned it right or not, or whether it even deserves consideration, that's how you know you're on board the ship that serves hors d'oeuvres and fluffs your pillows, while others are out at sea, swimming or drowning, or clinging to little inflatable rafts that they have to take turns keeping inflated, people short of breath, people who have never even heard of the word hors d'oeuvres or fluff. Then someone from up on the yacht says, it's too bad those people down there are lazy and not as smart and able as we are up here. We who have built these strong, large, stylish boats ourselves, we can float the seven seas like kings. And then someone else on board says something like, but your father gave you this yacht, and these are his servants who brought the hors d'oeuvres. At which point that person gets tossed overboard by a group of people. <laughs> At which point that person gets tossed overboard by a group of hired thugs who've been hired by the father who owned the yacht hired for the express, express purpose of removing any and all agitators on the yacht to keep them from making unnecessary waves or even referencing the father or the yacht itself. Meanwhile, the man thrown overboard begs for his life and the people on the small inflatable rafts can't get to him soon enough or they don't even try and the yacht's speed and weight cause an undertow. Then in whispers, while the agitator gets sucked under the yacht, private agreements are made, precautions are measured out, and everyone quietly agrees to keep on quietly agreeing to the implied rule of law and to not think about what just happened. Soon the father who put these things in place is only spoken of in the form of lore, stories told to children at night under the stars, at which point there are suddenly several fathers, noble, wise forefathers, and the boat sails on, unfettered. <clears throat> Apparent death. We won't have come expecting gunfire, a shooter. As many times as it happens, as we see it happen on our screens, we still walk around in our lives thinking, no, not us, that happens to them. The people on the other side of the screen, the victims, their families. We don't know those people. We don't even know the people who know those people. We're once and twice removed from most of what we see on the other side of the screen, especially that awful man, always a man. We watch and feel the horror, the unbelievable act for a day, for two whole days, for a week. We post and click links and like and don't like and repost and then and then it's like it didn't happen. We move on, the next thing comes. We get used to everything to the point that we even get used to getting used to everything. 
or we only think we're used to it until the shooter, until we meet him in real life. When he's there with us, the shots will come from everywhere, inside, outside, past, future, now. And we won't know right away where the shooter is. The bodies will drop. The depths of the booms will make our hearts skip beats. The rush of panic and spark and sweat on our skin. Nothing will be more real than the moment we know in our bones the end is near. There will be less screaming than we expect. It will be that prey silence of hiding. The silence of trying to disappear. To not be out there. We'll close our eyes and go deep inside. Hope that it's a dream or a nightmare. Hope that in closing our eyes we might wake up to that other life back on the other side of the screen where we can watch from the safety of our couches and bedrooms, from bus and train seats, from our offices, any place that is not there on the ground playing like we're dead, so not playing at all. We'll run like ghosts from our own dead bodies in hopes of getting away from the shots and the loud quiet of waiting for the next shot to fire. Waiting for another sharp hotline to cut across a life, cut off breath, bring too quickly the heat and then cooling of too soon death. We've expected the shooter to appear in our lives in the same way we know death is and always has been coming for us, with its decisive scythe, its permanent cut. We have expected to feel the boom of shots firing nearby, to fall to the ground and cover our heads, to feel like an animal, prey in a pile on the ground. We've known the shooter could show up anywhere, anywhere people gathered. We've expected to see him in our periphery, a masked shadow moving through the crowd, picking people off at random semi-automatic booms putting bodies down, sending them flailing through the broken air. A bullet is a thing so fast it's hot and so hot it's mean and so straight it moves clean through a body. Makes a hole, tears, burns, exits, goes on hungry, or it remains, cools, lodges, poisons. When a bullet opens you up, blood pours like out of a mouth too full. A stray bullet like a stray dog might up and bite anyone anywhere just because its teeth were made to bite, made to soften, tear through meat. A bullet is made to eat through as much as it can. Something about it will make sense. The bullets have been coming for miles, years. Their sound will break the water in our bodies, tear sound itself, rip our lives in half. The tragedy of it all will be unspeakable. The fact that we've been fighting for decades to be recognized as a present tense people, modern and relevant, alive, only to die in the grass wearing feathers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I feel like I, I would love to ask another hour of questions, but I, he's, got a, he's got a lot to do. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.